goal today of this panel it's an experiment we've never done this before prior to three fifty six and what the goal today is is what we're trying to do is to give you stimulate your thinking on both ideas in the health care field and how you might evaluate ideas and what we found you know over the last few years is that we get some fabulous student teams in three fifty six but often with ideas that don't really match the quality of the teams and what will happen is when you get in the class is if you have an idea that's too small doesn't seem to make a lot of sense doesn't fit in with a good value equa equation uh, that pretty quickly you get into a dead end in 356 and you need to reorient yourself and what we're trying to do this year is there's still going to be a lot of that that's the nature of the process of starting up companies I think as somebody characterized it last year sort of the drunken walk going back and forth from your original idea to find out something that really is going to take but we're hoping at least to sort of some way accelerate that process a little bit by giving you some uh, advice by some real experts uh, this evening. And let me you know, introduce the panel here. Is, uh, immediately to my left is uh, Fred Dotzler. Uh, Fred is a longtime, very experienced, very successful venture capitalist in the healthcare field. Originally has some uh, background from, from industry. Went into venture capital how long ago, Fred? Uh, 1984, so about 22 years. 22 years uh, in uh, doing uh, in medical devices, healthcare information systems, uh, biotech area, and don't forget drug delivery. Drug delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Even made the mistake of investing in uh, my company at one time. <laughs> and uh, 8x. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we Keep didn't going. do better. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Fred. Is most recently he's the uh, founding partner of De Novo Ventures, which is really a premier firm doing early stage startups in both the medical device field, principally, but also doing drug delivery, biotech, health information. So really applicable to this panel because it focuses on early stage companies. Uh, let's see, we have Mike Gertner who may be joining us, uh, but so I'll give him an introduction later. But uh, to uh, next to Fred is Stephanos Zenios, and Stephanos is probably known to many of you. Uh, Stephanos uh, teaches here at the uh, business school, and Stephanos is the healthcare guru here at the GSB, as I think many of you are aware. You know, he teaches, actually, Stephanos and I co teach uh, innovation and management of healthcare, and Stephanos' expertise there is on the delivery side, healthcare information side, medical device, device side. Plus, he uh, pioneered and developed the uh, biodesign class, which is really entrepreneurial class around biodesign. Uh, next to Stephanos is uh, Tom McConnell. And Tom is a GSB grad. Uh, started off originally in the technology industry, switched over to healthcare venture capital, what, in the mid 80s? Mm -hmm. And uh, was at NEA and was the lead healthcare partner at NEA, which many of you may know is one of the largest and most successful venture capital firms, you know, Tom has been the part, you know, part, you know, both early stage and later stage investor for a large number of very successful companies in the healthcare space, and most recently is at uh, Vanguard, Vanguard Ventures. And then we have, uh, finally, is Roy Whitfield. Roy Whitfield is also a GSB grad. Actually, Tom and Roy uh, were classmates here back in 1979. And Roy's background is Roy is a very successful uh, entrepreneur in the biotech and genomics field. He has a background in consulting and then in the pharmaceutical industry and then was the founder and CEO of uh, Insight Genomics. And Insight Genomics was really the pioneering and leading company in the genomics space back in the 1990s and early 2000s. And uh, Roy is, uh, left there a few years ago, serves on five boards, principally in uh, early stage biotech, genomics, pharmaceutical type companies. So I think we've got a great panel here with venture capital expertise, academic expertise on startups, and entrepreneurial expertise. And so maybe just as a start, you know, I'd like to get you know, the panel's thoughts on sort of what are the really big trends in healthcare right now, you know, in genomic, you know, some of the areas such as genomics, personalized medicine, healthcare information systems, you know, right, you know, control systems for healthcare costs. Now, what are some of the real big problems and opportunities that are that you see from your perspective? And I think everyone here is going to have a very different perspective in the healthcare space. So, uh, Fred, would you like to start? 
I will. Uh, I'd, I would say by far, from, from my perspective, uh, the biggest problem in healthcare today is uh, some uh, way to begin to contain healthcare costs. And it's real interesting, this has been a problem, you know, I, I, in preparation for this panel today, I went back and I looked through literature, and I've got articles from Wall Street Journal in 1989, 1990, 1991, that address the issue of uh, out of control healthcare costs, and here we are, uh, 17, 18 years beyond that, and no one yet has a grasp on, on what we're going to do with it. And I don't have any any big answers. I guess if there's any one answer that I would have, it's, it's, it's not something I would particularly say is an investment opportunity. It's just making individuals more responsible for more of their health care costs so they start doing health care shopping. Uh, and, and start putting a little more pressure on, on pricing at various levels uh, within the system. Uh, what we all fund here, I know Tom and I do, is usually kind of leading edge technology and, and some of it, in fact, some of the endoscopic surgery, early disease detection. Uh, there are areas where you can actually have an impact on healthcare costs, but there are a lot of things we do that uh, have better outcomes and extend longevity, but in reality uh, increase healthcare costs over the long term. Uh, Low-cost manufacturing, low-cost suppliers have, have not hit health care. I don't know that they ever will. I, I, I assume that they will at some point in time, but a prosthetic hip, a prosthetic knee still sells in the range of four to $5,000 per, and they're made by, you know, four or five different manufacturers, and it's a little bit of a cartel. They're, they, don't, they don't collude on price, but they don't lower uh, prices either, and, and uh, buying groups have tried various ways to hammer them and reduce their costs. And, and somehow they're, they're successful at the margin, but, but not in total terribly successful. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that, that is by far the, the biggest problem. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, we, we, we invest in things that, that have some impact on it, but I don't think uh, things that venture capitalists invest in, in aggregate have had much of an impact yet. Uh, healthcare information, the healthcare information component of it, I was an investor in a company called OmniCell. And it now has about a 500 million market cap. We, we sell uh, cabinets into hospitals to control uh, supplies and, and pharmaceuticals. And I know Tom was an early investor and a competitor in that area of Pixis. And uh, so I talked to the CEO today, and, and, and we had a good discussion about the state of the art in electronic medical records. And, and clearly there's, there's value to it. But uh, information technology implementation in healthcare is, is, is quite difficult because there, there are all kinds of legacy systems installed and uh, what, you, what you sell in healthcare information has to be pretty simply usable by existing customers within existing structures. And I asked him specifically about electronic medical records and he said some of the big physician practices are, some of the practices affiliated with hospitals have them, but he said, for the most part, it's, it's very, very slow and, and not a sea change overnight. So uh, I, I can tell you more about specific areas at, at any point you want to hear them, but, but that's kind of my overview. Uh, there's a lot of money being spent by the NIH and other government uh, funding agencies, DARPA, to uh, advance new technologies. So I think the opportunity set from a technology standpoint is as robust today as it has ever been. But at some point in time, uh, the system is going to have to figure out a way to contain costs, which are now 16% of GNP, and in the next 10 years are projected to go up to 18 and 19%. Stephanos? Um, so I agree. I think um, cost containment um, is a big concern uh, in healthcare. And, um, but the reality is, most of the technology that we'll be seeing coming out, at least in the foreseeable future, is technology that will sooner or later contribute to rising cost as opposed to lowering cost. Now, what that means for entrepreneurs, I think as people come up with ideas about innovative products and technologies, they need to realize that uh, they will need to be making an economic case. So having a understanding of what is what are the implications of the technology on the total economics of the healthcare system, be it on payer or provider, but those who will be using this technology and those who will be paying this technology. I think incorporating that as part of your evaluation of entrepreneurial opportunities is going to be important and become increasingly important. Um, 
I think this code, there is a whole movement towards making the consumers more involved in healthcare decision making. Um, again, I don't know if there are uh, any real proof of concept in terms of companies who showed how to translate that concept into money making one way or another. Uh, there are people who are pouring money to the space of consumer driven healthcare. There are things that appear to become as valid exit strategies, but I think the market opportunity is still small. And I would love to hear the, the thoughts of the other people in the panel whether they agree or disagree with that. Uh, I think in general there is also this dichotomy between products and services. And from, from where I see things from my academic lens, it seems that most of the products they have a well-defined business model that venture investors would like. Most of the services, they seem to be much more challenging. And maybe ser new service models are what is going to transform our healthcare system to something much more efficient, but there is always a question, what is a business model? And for products, the business models are much cleaner because you know who is paying for them, uh, it's well proven. For services, the business models are much more challenging. So. I think if I would look into things, in the long run, uh, we will have to see innovative business models that would make healthcare delivery more efficient, but the business models are not proven. And the business model that seems to be proven in the current environment is business model of new technology that improves quality of care, improves outcomes, probably at higher expenses than what is currently available. Information technology, um, there is some interesting movement in um, ASP models where you don't have to have them installed in the hospital, but rather a company offers them as a service. And I could talk about some specifics later on, but those could be a way of breaking through the inertia. The adoption of healthcare IT is rather slow for many of the reasons that you have mentioned. The business case and the ROI is very weak if you take into account all the installation costs. Uh, and I think there are new companies who are looking into ASP models who may be able to create a more compelling business case. Oh. Yes, I'd like to focus on initially on healthcare spending. It's large and growing largely because the population in the United States is <clears throat> aging, as we all know, and as you age, people consume more healthcare. And just to give you some numbers, in 2004, healthcare spending amounted to about 1.7 trillion, or 15% of GDP. It's growing at about 7% per annum. And so, in, in a prospectus we wrote for a fund, we projected GDP forward at 4%. And if, it, if healthcare spending keeps growing at 7%, it's going to account for 20% of GDP by, I think it's 2013. And that's largely driven by, again, the aging of the population and increased consumption of health care. Um, right now, there are about 44 million US citizens age 60 and above. By 2013, there'll be 59 million. And that's essentially what's driving it, as you probably all know. And um, it's interesting, at, at our fund, we focus only on medical devices because we're, we have a smaller amount of capital under management. We don't feel that we can invest in, bio, in the biopharmaceutical industry or in companies of that type because they're so capital intensive. But our research showed that medical devices of all, of all types accounted for 220 billion of the 1.7 trillion in healthcare spending in 2004, and believe it or not, that was larger than the whole pharmaceutical industry at 211 billion. Now that was a surprise. Now not all of those are the types of devices that we in the venture business would fund. A lot of them are quite mundane and not really high technology, more commodity in nature. And one of the trends that we try and exploit, I think all venture capitalists try and do this, is to exploit the trend toward minimally invasive procedures because they reduce the cost, they lower complications, they allow earlier discharge. I think what Fred said, though, is true that, and, and also, you know, generally, a lot of these new procedures do increase costs, but if you're able to focus on less invasive procedures, 
you, you at least have a shot at reducing overall system costs because, again, the patients out of the hospital or out of the surgery center earlier, rehabilitation's faster and so forth. So that's a good trend. And I'm not sure this is exactly on point, Rob, but one other thing that I would observe, um, therapeutic companies tend to pay off better than diagnostic. And it's the lesson that everyone in the venture industry tends to learn. You know, the joke is generally every venture capitalist does one diagnostic deal and, and no more after that. I guess if you do a successful deal, and there are always exceptions, you know, personalized medicine now requires diagnostic. There are always exceptions that some people are able to do them successfully, but in general, it's difficult to get the same kind of valuations for diagnostic deals. The product cycles are faster. There's a lot of competition. And even on the IT side of venture capital, you don't get paid as much for like a, a device that diagnoses a network versus one that routes, you know, uh, routes data in a network. It's sort of the same principle. And so I know that's not exactly on point, but it, in terms of talking about what areas are attractive, I would say therapeutic medical devices that lead to less invasive procedures would be a large category that spans coronary disease, uh, orthopedics, and so forth. Yeah, the, uh, the area that's particularly close to my heart is uh, improving productivity of the uh, development process for drugs and diagnostics. As many of you know, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to develop uh, uh, develop a drug. And one of the interesting things about the drug industry is I can't think, maybe you guys can, of another industry where, particularly one that's so big, where people actually don't know why the product works. <laughs> and um, one of the reasons for that is the, bio, the difference between biological sciences and physical sciences. The biological sciences, by and large, are pretty data poor. And um, you, know, you don't see, I've noticed often biological professors wear a, or wear a bow, you know, and you, you don't see them with pens in their pocket. They're just not used to you know, really, <laughs> really thinking through driving down the cost of that, making it reproducible. They're very used to saying, I think this is the way this works, and then hoping that it, uh, or hoping that it all uh, c comes about. So that's a historical perspective, but what, you know, what's been happening over the last 20 years is that IT has really started to impinge upon this process. You know, starting in the 90s with the genomics revolution. And one of the things that's happened is there was a huge surge of venture capital money into you know, IT applications in, the, in this development process. A lot of money was lost. But the way biotech investors sort of you know, work is they tend to move in and out and all the rest of it. But the fundamental trend is very much like you see in the IT sectors. You know, these things are now absolutely getting nailed. And you're, you're now starting to see the first personalized diagnostic companies like Genomic Health, they're now here. You know, um, they can basically take a breast tumor and give you an excellent prognosis of you know, how that tumor is going to develop by looking at a small panel of 24 genes. That was something people started talking about about 10 years ago, and now it's uh, finally, uh, finally happening. So I, I, my guess would be, and certainly some of the things that I look at now, if any of you have good contacts in the engineering school or chemical engineering, and you know, you may find by thinking about something that they're working on and how it might specifically apply uh, into um, the, this process might be uh, something that's, uh, that's really good. I, I see lots of opportunities in the, the whole area of medicinal chemistry. That historically is a black box. The way drugs are developed in the past is, you know, being kind of facetious, but, you know, there's a bunch of drugs, we'll throw them into 100 rats and see how many of them sort of, uh, you know, sort of survive. Now we can understand in exquisite detail what the drug is doing to the rat by understanding how it impacts all the different proteins in, in the body and all the relative, uh, the relative pathways. So um, I think this whole concept of IT and how it impacts the drug and the diagnostic development process is um, something that I've been associated with for quite a while and um, uh, is, you know, can play into many of the cost containment trends that you've heard uh, from the, uh, from the other panelists. Yes. Actually, Roy, I think it's interesting you mentioned genomic, you know, genomic health, because I think it'd be helpful uh, for the students here is if maybe if each of you could walk through a company or so, you know, or two that illustrate, you know, that was a startup company that, you know, might be practical for the students to understand, that illustrates some of the trends and say, this is a really good area to be in. This is how this company got into this area, and this is the model that they're going after. Rob, you better keep a, a firm watch on the time you let venture capitalists talk about their companies and yeah. go on for hours. 
Take two. <laughs> One, but more than enough. Do you want to go ahead and start, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd be glad to. Um, the one, he, he previewed the questions in advance so we could be prepared, but a company that I'd like to talk about is uh, called Asthmatics, and uh, our fund invested in Asthmatics about a year ago, and we got right to the verge of going public about a week or so ago and decided to, all I can say is take a more attractive option, and we can't say anything more than that, but I did want to, Asthmatics is a therapeutic medical device that falls into the category that I described earlier in the opening and my opening comments, and what it does is it treats asthma with a RF frequency device. It's the, to my knowledge, the only medical device for asthma. Everything else is uh, a drug therapy, and so there was um, this this gentleman who's an MD at Menlo Ventures. His name is Mike Lauper, and he had the observation that there's this airway smooth muscle tissue in the bronchial tubes and that gets thickened in asthmatics and, and tends to spasm and contract. And so he had the idea of going in with a, a radio frequency catheter and heating it, this muscle tissue up to about the temperature of a hot cup of coffee so it doesn't burn it. But it, by doing that, it reduces the amount or the mass of smooth muscle tissue. And that has been shown in a number of clinical studies conducted in Europe and Canada to substantially reduce the, the contractions and the spasm and asthma and to give these patients that are on bronchodilators and corticosteroids a much better quality of life. And so one, there, there are a number of attractive aspects of this company that I'd like to call your attention to. One is that um, about 11, Let's see, the direct costs of asthma in the United States are about $11.5 billion each year. There are 14 million adults that suffer from asthma, and about 2 million of them are se severe asthmatic. So these are asthmatics that can't be controlled with this drug therapy. And so they have these breakthrough events where they have to go into the hospital. It's life-threatening, and it's very expensive for the healthcare system. So this, um, this is a device that would the, the treatment would be done actually in three different treatments. I won't go into all the details. It, it, it uses a bronchoscope that goes either into the nose or into the mouth. And this RF catheter is introduced through that mechanism, so it's minimally invasive. It's an outpatient procedure. And this, uh, this heating element is applied to the bronchial tubes. And so after that, these patients, I mean, right now the company's conducting a placebo controlled trial to show that it's safe and efficacious, but there have already been four trials previously. So anyway, the hope is that it will show, uh, prove safety and efficacy, and then this device can be approved and sold on the market. But it, it really, it's attractive because it addresses a huge unmet need. It's the only medical device that's, that's um, in this category, and it has dominant IP position, a uh, dominant IP or intellectual property position, which in the medical device business, it's very unusual to establish that kind of position. Usually in like the coronary stent business or whatever, orthopedic in the spine area, you have so many competitors and there's overlapping intellectual property. It's very hard as a venture capitalist to really sort out whether you're going to be able to prevail. You want to try and make sure that you're not infringing somebody else. But here, this company is the only one. Now, on the downside, they're going to have to reestablish or establish new uh, reimbursement codes. As was mentioned earlier, you know, that is a big challenge that when you start off with a medical device, you have to think beyond getting FDA approval. I mean, that's the first step. You need to get paid for that therapy. And so you have to start on that very early on in the development and figuring out how you're going to show that it is worthy of reimbursement. So one of the challenges that this company will face is how it can develop new reimbursement codes for this procedure. Stefan, so here's, are there some that you've seen you know, either coming out of your class or that you study that you think are particularly applicable good models for the students to think about? So my disclosure, I'm not an investor, so <laughs> <laughs> I see things from a different perspective. A couple of examples. Um, I think one company, which, uh, 
I, I don't recall the name, but I'll tell you the history, because I don't think it would be, probably wouldn't be an interesting uh, investment opportunity for venture capitalists, but it found a good life of its own. It started out of Israel. Uh, the company was eventually acquired by Biosales Webster, um, which offers um, devices for ablation for patients with atrial fibrillation. So background atrial fibrillation is a form of arrhythmia. Uh, it's common, it's becoming much more common and much more prevalent. Uh, it's considered one of the major arrhythmias and one of the major uh, areas where the, there are a lot of medical needs. And it causes flow if it's not treated. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's deadly uh, if it's not treated properly. Uh, one of the treatments is ablation. So you need to insert a catheter by your way to the heart and burn part of heart tissue to correct for that arrhythmia. The problem that you have is that when you have a catheter in the heart, uh, you are a little bit in the dark. Uh, of course, there are imaging that you can have, so it can tell you where to burn. But what this company in Israel did, they developed this three-dimensional mapping of the heart so that you can get this information, you could program them with any type of catheter, and that would cut down the time it took for the procedure from two hours to one hour and 30 minutes or so on. That on its own is not a standalone company, but it's a technology that Bios and Webster found it to be useful as part of their core product offering. So what this is saying is, when you start thinking about medical opportunities, there are the therapeutics, uh, and these are things that probably would attract the interest of venture investors, but then there are other opportunities that would be of interest to large corporate partners. Now, this could be challenging because uh, if you go for a therapeutic, you know that if you have venture investors, at the end you can go to the market, you don't need to worry about a couple of buyers that could corner you. If you have a technology that is viable only as part of the offerings of Biosense Webster or Metroni or Buster Scientific, you are having more difficult problems. But there are small startups with legal funding who manage to prove that concept. The market is smaller, but it works. Another example of a company that was recently acquired in the diagnostic space, and I don't know what is the multiple for that, is Metrica. Um, what they did is uh, they developed this at-home monitor for hemoglobin A1C. This is to monitor patients how well they control their, to monitor diabetic patients how well, well they control their blood glucose. Uh, the challenge that they had to face, they needed a new code, they needed a new reimbursement, and, uh, but they incorporated that as part of their product development process to start working on getting the code and getting the reimbursement lined up along with uh, getting their product approved. Uh, what I know is that they, so they have venture investment, they got acquired by buyer about three or four months ago. Again, I don't know what is the multiple or how lucrative that investment was for venture investors, but it's a diagnostic company. And the venture firm invested in them. They invested previously in other diagnostics. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Maybe it's a counterexample. There are some venture firms who repeatedly invest in diagnostics. It's a more challenging market, though. Uh, I would say one thing on the diagnostics market, and I, I agree with Tom. Uh, diagnostic instrumentation is really, really tough. There is a, an area of uh, diagnostics that Stefano mentioned, which is in vitro diagnostics. I invested in biocyte diagnostics back in 1989, and it's been over a billion dollar market cap, and we made a ton of money on it. And I was on the board there 10 years, and I learned a whole bunch about the diagnostics market. So that's in vitro versus the instrumentation, where Tom said is absolutely perfectly on diagnostic instrumentation. Stuff. I love this in vitro stuff, and the reason I love it is no one else does. And I have another company in, in the shop right now that I've been working on for about three months, and my biggest job is to find another venture group that will do it with me. <laughs> and, and I've got a couple of them that are close, so Tom, if you'll do in vitro diagnostics, or uh, avoid, or stuff, and I'll just talk. So would, Fred, would you say in general the venture industry views it the way I described? Yes, yeah. 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 yeah and there, are always, there are always exceptions in like glucose monitoring and so forth. My first and only one. Uh, for the glass, though. I mean, is that yeah. the fact that venture capitalists don't go for yeah. something? Is that really? Oh. Maybe yeah. 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 positive. Yeah. 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 This was a 15x for us. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, it, yeah. For this class, it doesn't need to be venture. What you just need to do is figure out a financing scheme. 
And sometimes the financing scheme could be friends and family, sometimes it could be angel, sometimes it can be a corporate partner, and sometimes it could be you do research the first few years, get funding, and then learn to do things. So it's actually, I mean, that's a very good point, Roy, because a lot of times people think of what has to be venture funded, whereas for this class, it's what does it take to start a good business, and if you have alternate means of financing, that maybe that's great. And for a lot of people, that's actually preferred because they're looking to do a business they get more control of. Sure. You're talking about financing, so that's the question. How much money are we talking about? I know it's going to be a broad range, but... For what? Is, to fund a company? Well, yes, to get such a device to enable it to be to at least enter the market. So I, I what think is a, a, a 510K device to get into the market is probably 25 to 35 million, somewhere in that range. That's over a couple of rounds, two or three rounds. When you're looking at PMA devices, I mean, they've gone way up. I mean, for a lot of reasons, they're a little explain to the class what a 5 volt, yeah, what the difference Good is. Good point. A 510K is you, you have to show equivalence to a, a device that the FDA has already approved. Uh, PMA is you have to do a de novo from the beginning, uh, tightly controlled clinical trial and prove that it has clinical utility. Uh, so it costs a lot more to do PMA products than it does to do 510K. It's a longer time horizon. And, and PMA products can cost, I'd say, almost a minimum of 50 million to, to 100 million. You know, we still invest in them, but you, know, you have to be looking at a much bigger payout uh, to justify them. And maybe just to contrast it, you know, is why don't we also say, we've talked about medical devices. What would it take if you were doing a standard diagnostics company, a genomics space, you know, personalized medicine genomics company, and a biotech company? You know, maybe just to give everybody ballpark ranges for different types of companies and what it takes for them. <coughs> and we'll just say, and, and if you can answer two ways, what it takes for it typically to get to an exit strategy that's good, and what it takes to actually get the company to be profitable. Just ballpark numbers. Well, and I realize they range all over the map. Yeah, on, on, the, on the biotech side, it can be humongous. I mean, you know, we've, we have a company right now that's uh, gonna, going to finish up phase two trials uh, in July of next year. That's phase two trials. Phase, phase, you do a lot of preclinical in animal work to show that you don't uh, that you have some 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 thoughts or some scientific proof that it might work in humans. Then you go into phase one, which is strictly a safety trial. And uh, in, in some diseases, you can actually do phase one trials in disease patients, which is really, really valuable because you get a lot of information to help design the phase two trials. Then you go into phase two trials, which are bigger numbers of patients, and it's, it's patient selectivity, dose ranging, and, and, and variables like that. Then to get FDA approval, you have to do phase three trials, usually two phase three trials. The number of patients uh, can get very large depending on, on what the greater the impact, the smaller the number of patients. So, uh, well, you chime in here at any point. Uh, but I would say to get a company through phase three, I mean, depending on the disease, it, it can be, it, it's hard to imagine you can do it less than 100 million, and it can go 500 million real easily. So it's really, really but, big money. But, but if it, what tends to happen is so that they can become self funded. Yeah, or they get taken out, and that for us, we can talk about that as a trend, but in the last uh, two or three years, there have been a lot of companies that did not have drugs approved that got taken out by major pharmaceutical or biotech companies at very, very good valuations. I don't want to say multiples, it's multiples of invested capital, not multiples of sales or, or earnings because they didn't have it. It's like outsourced R&D. But I think yeah. that's a very good point because if you're looking to start a business in this area, you know, you need to think you know, about what the financing needs are concurrent with when you're even thinking is just the concept even viable, much more so than many other industries, unless you're doing maybe a health care information you know, product. Do you want me to give an example of a company? Or, or yeah, we do a quick example. Oh. It covers a few other areas, too, so go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, I will cover a device company. I can cover a biotech company. Why don't you go biotech? Because we've got an example okay. of a diagnostic okay. and, a, and a device. Okay. Uh, a, 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 a biotech company we funded, I guess, about four years ago is a company called Fabril, F-A-B-R-I-L-L-E. It's down in San Diego. And the, uh, the shtick of the company is it's patient-specific therapy. And this gets into the, the diagnostic arena. We don't sell a diagnostic with it. But it's patient-specific therapy for uh, patients with B-cell B lymphoma. And B cell lymphoma is a, is a cancer of, of, uh, of B cells. There is a drug that treats it called rituxan. 
It's an antibody against a marker on all B cells called CD20. So if you have IV uh, rituxan for your B cell lymphoma, you're going to knock out your entire uh, B cell component of your immune system. So what Fabril does is uh, the company goes in and takes a biopsy of, of a uh, cancerous lymph node and actually determines the genetic sequence of the B cell clone that's gone awry, just the, the specific one B cell clone that's gone awry, and they use that to create a vaccine which they reinfuse in the patient. And uh, the shtick that the company has is they, they, they figured out a way to, to increase, uh, decrease the production time it, it, it had been done by scientific groups, research groups, in six to nine months. They figured out a way to do it in insect cells in uh, six to eight weeks, so you can get a quick turnaround to the patient. Uh, uh, we completed, when I invested in the company, they, had, they were finished with phase one, they had started phase two, and we had to recruit a CEO, but the valuation was pretty reasonable for what it was. It was, I think it was $15 million free money for someone who had safety data and some indication of efficacy based on its academic work. But again, very patient specific. Uh, the company is now uh, well, in, totally enrolled in, in two phase three trials and will uh, we'll, uh, introduce data on response rate improvement uh, in, the, in this quarter and then uh, time to progression uh, uh, mid next year. It's a public company. Uh, so that's a biotech company. And the reason I, I mentioned that one is it's, it's one of these patient specific ones where the therapy is for every patient, it's a different therapy. Now that has implications in, in terms of your factory, but they've also been real clever. A lot of their technology is how they, how they, how they develop the, the little enclosed uh, bag type system for, for each patient. You know? and, and the therapy will be quite expensive, but you know, all these biologics are very, very expensive because, because it takes a lot of infrastructure to get them through this process and then manufacture them after they're uh, approved. Well, I'd like to kind of change you know, a little bit from kind of talking about specific. I'm going to talk a little bit about some advice for the students. And, you know, specifically, you know, a lot of people here are you know, interested in 3D56, want to do a project, don't have an idea. I mean, you'd mentioned earlier about you know, going and talking to you know, possibly people in engineering or med school. But if you were to student, you know, and you said, I want to come up with an idea, I want to do a healthcare idea, I'm not sure what it is. You know, I'd be curious, you know, sir, what advice would you have for how to go about doing that? And I'd be curious also from the other panelists. Yeah, I really. Yeah, I just go and ask all the people you used to work for. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how I get them. You know, I. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you know, well, yeah, I, you know, in the field that I know best, it, it, it's. It, it's hard for me to come up with something other than that, you know, because it's all, it's the application essentially of, of IT into the drug discovery process. So, you know, there's lots of great things on the computing power is just making the costs of, you know, a lot of the analyses a lot, uh, a lot better. Computational chemistry is a really interesting, uh, really interesting area. Um, you know, some guys in the, you know, in the, in the chemistry arena, you know, ke chemical space in the past has been viewed as just sort of too big, you know, that you cannot possibly sort of catalog at all. And that's all kind of changing now. So you can start to think about uh, mapping the whole space and thinking about how it applies in, into different drug situations. And I know, I know some technology that's come out of Stanford that uh, we've just been funded uh, to do that. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Roy is right on. I, I think if, unless you're, you're an engineer who's capable of inventing and, and creating something yourself, then I think you're going to have to find a, uh, a co-founder or someone who has the technology. And that, that presumes you want to do a technology company. Healthcare services are not quite as technology driven. They're more business, you know, management teams. And it's real interesting. Healthcare services, uh, if you look at where the, the good returning healthcare services companies have been created, it's, it's places like Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Baltimore's had some, yeah. and, and I think it's kind of a function of the environment. You know, Kaiser's been a big player here. You know, the healthcare has been treated differently in California than a lot of other places. But delivery there hasn't been a lot of innovation. But I, I would say, if you want to start a technology company, either either drug oriented or, or research product oriented or information oriented or medical <coughs> device oriented, and you don't have the background, then I think you have to you have to find a way to to hook up with someone uh, who has that. 
if I could add something, it's um, um, the biodesign process I've been teaching OIT3 for, and I told Rob that I will shamelessly talk about that course as well. Um, <laughs> Go ahead and plug away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is, um, thinking about companies, um, and this may sound a little bit academic, but do you start a company by having a technology looking for a need, or do you start from a need and then you try to find the technology? Uh, as you know, most of you are MBAs. I think you're probably better off uh, looking into the need and then partnering with a technology person to find the technology. If you partner with an engineer, especially very early on, they will have a concept of what is the technology that they have. And maybe the need is not there. And that's where you have you have to be very rigorous to make sure that the need is there. The engineers will solve the problem. So we solve the problem, it's going to be elegant. It's going to be a great solution. And I'm an engineer with my heart. I always like to solve problems. But maybe at the end of solving their own problem, or maybe the engineers will eventually be solving their own problem. So this is something that you have to keep in mind. What is the medical need? Now, in medical devices, something that you know, I learned from my colleagues in the School of Medicine, School of Engineering, and one of them has started a lot of companies and has been very successful, actually both of them. Um, what, they, what they are doing is they observe how medical procedures are being done. They, we have uh, the fellows in the program, they spend day in and day out, and I see one of them, oh, should be just left. <laughs> one of them was here. Uh, they spend day in and day out following procedures at staff of hospital. Seeing how surgeons do things, and the story we tell our students is, when you see the little droplets of sweat flowing down the surgeon's forehead, you know you have a medical need. <laughs> and the more surgeons you see having that problem, the more important that need is. Then you have other problems. A need at Stanford Hospital may not necessarily be a need where there is a huge market. Stanford Hospital is treating some of the most extreme cases. But what this is saying is, when you are looking for an opportunity, you may have a great technology, and you have to look for the need. You have to be very rigorous and dissociate yourself from the engineer who will tell you what is great with your technology. You have to figure out what is the need, and the FDA is your great at doing that. Uh, if you identify a need, then you need engineers and work with them to come up with much more concepts of how to address that need. Because maybe the technology that will come up first as the solution to the need is a technology that's exciting and cool, but maybe technology that's too expensive to bring to the market. If you come up with four solutions, maybe you can also find the solution that will get to the market in the least amount of money and address some of the needs. So this is a little bit of an academic framework that we are using in the biodesign program, uh, starting with the need and trying to get to the solution. Uh, and again, the big question is, is there a market there? The technology may be cool, the solution may be great, but if there is no market, then that's great things that academics can do, but not necessarily for, uh, for business. I'd like to just add to, to what you said, and uh, actually one of the, the people, Paul Yock, is, uh, I had the pleasure of backing him early yeah. on, and he told me about this biodesign program where they, the students go and observe the surgeons to understand where the needs are, and then they try and invent something that will solve that need. But if you are looking for a class project, I mean, one thing you might do is look. You can get um, an idea of disease prevalence, you know, by doing research. Uh, like, in, you know, we wrote this up for our our. PPM that high blood pressure is, is one that's most prevalent, 50 million Americans, coronary artery disease, 13.6, congestive heart failure, on and on. So you can get an idea of disease prevalence, and then you can find how much is spent in the healthcare system on these diseases. So, you know, if you're trying to look into an area that, that's still a big problem, you can get a sense of prevalence and spending and then maybe approach doctors and, and find an area that you're interested in. Are you interested in like coronary artery disease, stroke, or uh, spinal disease, that kind of thing? So I would say, you know, find a big problem and see, and then talk to doctors. I mean, I'm particularly talking if you're if you need a class project, interview some doctors and find out where they think the problems are, and. 
you know, it's going to be hard, I would think, in a class project to identify a technologist that can develop. I mean, that's a long process. And so, you know, maybe the doctor could suggest, again, getting at the need, I, I believe that's the critical way to approach it, find out what the needs are, and then maybe that doctor could suggest some solutions to you. This is in the medical device area. The, the, the one thing I would add to that is I was trying to jump the curve a little bit and, and not go through the need process. Yeah. Assuming there was a finite amount of time, clearly if there's no need, you don't do it. Uh, but engineers, you know, in my in my opinion, are usually better than docs. I mean, docs can identify what the problems are. So then, then you, you size the market, you find a doc, then you still have to find the engineer, you know, right? Because the docs don't usually have solutions. There are some, my partner, John Simpson, yeah. is a big exception. Paul Yacht, you yeah. know, guys like that, Peter Fitzgerald. Well, and what they're trying to do here is cultivate other, you know, people like that. Yeah. 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 Do students have access to the intellectual property, and, you know, the technology licensing? Oh, that's good. Yeah, actually, they do. And yeah. it actually yeah. seems yeah. like where ideas come yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. These people go to the uh, Stanford Technology Licensing Office and say, gee, you know, what, thing, what interesting things are you trying to uh, yeah. license? Often what you'll find, I, I, I predict you may well find something may have new imaging technology or miniaturization. Mm -hmm. And then often what people do is speculate in the patent on all the possible uses because they're trying mm -hmm. to. And you may find something in there, and then, you know, if somehow that triggers some interest in you, and you went to the inventor and said, "Hey, I, you know, I think yeah, I, I know how to do that." And, you know, they'll want to be part of that. You know, so, 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 Rob, what, what, what is what is the general background of the class? I mean, uh, general business or engineer scientist or a little bit of everything? Well, why don't you ask? How many of you, you know, kind of, you know, how many are MBAs here right now? How many have any sort of a healthcare background? How many in engineering background? Oh, How right. many none of the above? Okay, there you go. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I'm particularly yeah. proud of the none of the aboves here. <laughs> I hope we all have the best projects. Yeah. But, uh, but this, well, maybe you have to make sure we have some time. Is there any questions that, yeah, just open it up here. Yeah, I was just hoping Professor Zinios could help me understand the, I guess, the, the benefits and the, and the pros and the cons between 356 versus biodesign. Okay. Because, I mean, we're all, <laughs> we're all interested in healthcare here, and it's, I mean, from a business school perspective, from a business student's perspective, you know, I want to learn how to write the business plan. I want to okay. learn how to go get the financing. I want to meet the venture capitalists. Um, Take both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got nine months. <laughs> I, I teach a course with Rob, remember? <laughs> okay, I, I, I tell you about uh, biodesign and okay. then I Rob. Please go, yeah, please go ahead. Because uh, so biodesign, how it works, um, we have identified a set of needs already. Uh, and it's uh, we typically have, uh, we're going to be presenting to you the needs. This year, the needs are all in orthopedics area. Uh, then what you do, we have developed this process where we walk you through, we give you the need, we walk you through how do you do basic market research of prevalence, epidemiology, economics, uh, existing technologies to address the need, existing reimbursement. Uh, the point of doing this is to do some preliminary need validation. Is that need real or is it something that uh, the fellows have imagined? Once you do that by the end of the first four weeks, this is done individually, you have to, if you have convinced yourself that the need is good enough, you have to convince other people in the classroom to join you in a team. The teams are multidisciplinary, so typically a strong team would have an MBA, an engineer, a doctor, slash someone with biological scientific background, and maybe a second engineer. Second half of the first quarter, work on developing concepts, different ways of addressing the needs. Most of these are gizmos and of medical devices. Uh, every now and then we have some interesting service concepts. Uh, never biotechs. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to come up with a drug or biologic way to approach these needs. Uh, mm -hmm. By the end of the first quarter, uh, the teams come up with a preferred concept. The second quarter is about developing a business plan. Now, we don't teach you as much about writing a business plan or developing a business plan as probably you would learn in S356. What we teach in the biodesign class is the specifics of medical, medical technology primarily, medical devices. So 510K versus PMA. 
knowing the difference, knowing whether your device is good for hydrogen K or a PMA. We have people who come from the FDA who tell you about different cases, figuring out the reimbursement. How do you figure out whether there exists an investment for a medical device? Figuring out uh, exit strategies for specific medical devices. We teach you about the relevant databases and how to go through them and figure out what are the exit strategies and what are the possible acquirers and what are the possible multiples. All these very specific medical devices. So I think what you get in the biodesign course is uh, an immersion into medical device innovation. Uh, I think Rob is probably the best person to talk yeah, about I mean, that. I can't That's contrast anymore more telling you about 356 because I'm not an expert on the, uh, but 356 is a much more process oriented class. I mean it's much more you come in with an idea already formed. You spend the first probably month or two very similar to that doing market research around it but oftentimes the ideas morph into something very different. Because mm -hmm. you go and say gee this doesn't quite work, this doesn't quite work. Well, then, and you end up with you know, probably a pretty different idea than you originally came in with. And then you spend most of the rest of the class in the whole process of how you actually would start that business. You know, you know, what would the personnel plan be? What would be the, you know, the budgeting you'd need to go through? Where would you locate the company? What type of management do you, need to hire, do you need to hire for that? And then we spend the last part of the class packaging that both into how to write the business plan, though frankly we put a lot more energy into how you actually put together what we hopefully is a dynamite venture capital presentation. Mm -hmm. And then at the end you actually, uh, Fred, Tom, and Roy at various times have actually all served on panels when you judge it. So it, I think, you know, my guess is you know, one of them is much more, in, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, it's an immersion, as you said it, really in what do you need to know everything about devices. 356 is much more, what's the whole process for starting a business? And it's sort of, it's quite agnostic from the area, but it's also much more applicable if you come in with an exist. You need an existing idea to come in with. Yeah, that's one of the major differences. Yeah. We give you that. We give you the needs. Yeah. And the Excel app they are with engineers yeah. that can help you figure out the technology. You you go through some of the earlier parts of the process. You can come out of your course with a need and then go to your course. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I've taken in that order. I've had people who <laughs> actually come into our class after they've gone through biodesign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that actually can, uh, it can happen sometimes. And depending on how advanced they got in biodesign, our, you know, there may be a lot of overlap or it may be a whole new set of work that they're doing. I'm curious to know what the panel's view is, uh, particularly Fred and Tom, on specialty hospitals. And that's a growing trend, obviously, but from a venture perspective, is it, is it something that you're interested in? But do you have any experience in that? Uh, we, I, have, I have invested in healthcare services company in my career. We at Genova do not do healthcare, so we do not invest in healthcare services. I know they're a growing trend. Uh, uh, I think in communities where you have big patient populations, they make sense. And the ones I'm aware of are, are cardiac surgery. Uh, I, I don't know if, if there are any yet beyond that, but, but uh, if you have enough patient volume, I think they make a lot of sense because you can run the cost down for those, those specific uh, uh, procedures with, without having all the overhead to do everything else. I, you know, I, I like them just generically. Um, if I could add something, um, I did a couple of research in that area a couple of years ago, primarily because in the biodesign course, we're getting all these health services ideas and we didn't know what to do with them. So we went around and asked, asked, started uh, interviewing some virtual investors. What we got, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we got the sense that the specialty hospital deals are of interest to private equity yeah. uh, investors. Uh, it's typically consolidating and scaling up and making them more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a different model than the venture investment model. Uh, so if you look where you have deals working in specialty hospitals, they tend to come in private equity firms to be interested in this type of deals. Just a quick point. It's been, it's been interesting. I, uh, Tom and I have been in this business for quite a while. Uh, there was a time, I would say, even as recently as, as five or six years ago, that if you had a, a, an idea for a healthcare IT company, there were a lot of venture groups that invested in healthcare IT, and it's, there, there's kind of a perverse thing that ran it, or that drove it. There's a company down in Atlanta called HBO, HBLC, and if you could get a company up to 10 or 12 million in revenue, they took you out at 150 to 250 million. And they, they, you know, they bought a lot of companies, and there were a couple others too. In, in, in the last uh, five yeah, years, on it, it, yeah. <laughs> and then in the last couple of years, three or four years, I mean, it's not many venture groups do it. Healthcare services 
there are still, you know, five to ten groups around the U.S. in healthcare services investing. But it's mainly, as Fred said earlier, focused in the southeast. I mean, you have to speak southern too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a specific question for Fred about uh, Basil. And um, a lot, there have been a few other companies in, in this space that have been working on cancer vaccines for quite a while. Um, Cell Genesis is one that I'm thinking of. Dendrion is another. And they've been at it for a long time, and some, you know, gotten to phase three and gotten logged down, and and then not getting their drugs approved or, or their process approved. So I was wondering, what specifically about that company that you saw as a venture capitalist made you, you know, uh, take the risk, and, and also what kind of return are you looking from, say? An investment like that. The, the, the first uh, answer to the question is there was a guy at Stanford who started doing this probably in about 1992. His name is Larry Kwok, K W A K, K W A K, K W A K, K W A K, Larry Kwok, and and he had he has run patients out in an academic environment to nine and ten and by now twelve and thirteen years and kept patients alive with B cell lymphoma. So there's tremendous academic proof of concept. He was doing it with hybridoma technology. It's very, very expensive, you know, pretty long term. And he actually had started a company to do it. Uh, uh, the second thing is by the time we invested in the company, we had, we had all of that information. And, and also the company had already proven their manufacturing system, had got the FDA approval to get through phase one, and we're in just beginning phase two trials. Now, what we expect to get for return on it, I mean, I, I, you know, it's hard to tell because it will, we will know the answer when they, when they get the clinical endpoints from these two phase three trials. I'm very optimistic about it, uh, but I can't, I, can't give you a, I can't give you what it's going to be. If, if you talk to me next year at this time, I'll know the answer. How about other uh, similar biotechs that have paid off for you? Are you, I mean, uh, you know, I've been in classes with uh, VCs that are invested in, you know, we did, we did the B round in Tularic uh -huh. and, and followed Tularic back in 1991. Tularic is a real interesting company. Every company we invest in, I mean, there's a whole story behind it, but, but they were going after interfering with, uh, with transcription factors binding to, to DNA and, and uh, starting transcription with small molecules. So they set up this whole system. They, they, they procured a lot of drugs and a lot of molecular diversity back in the early 90s before a lot of people were doing it. And then he had Dave Goodell as a molecular biologist, so he developed all these assays. And in the end, after three years, they proved it didn't work. You know, the, the, the binding surface area was too big to interfere with small molecules. So uh, they redefined themselves as uh, interfering with gene regulation. And they did, again, a lot of molecular biology. Their molecular diversity uh, kept growing. We were lucky, I guess, because there was a time when you could take companies public and raise a lot of money in the public markets. We had a, an investor from Switzerland who put in a whole bunch of money at a time when they needed it. It was eventually taken out two years ago by Amgen for $1.6 billion. So again, we made uh, a real nice return on our money, even though uh, when it was bought by Amgen, they didn't have a product in the market. They, they had a lot of stuff in, 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 uh, in cancer that they had in license and you know, a lot of uh, technology. So that's, but the times have changed. I mean, biotech is, uh, is quite a bit different now than it was, you know, back in the early 90s, even in the late 90s. It's, it's really tough right now because the public market just doesn't want to pay until you have, uh, you have proven success in phase three trials. Just generalizing on your point, though, about one of the things I've seen in biotech is technologies are too easily written off. And I think you've got to take this IT perspective. So just take antibody technology. You know, I, I mean, there are all kinds of antibody drugs on the market now, but I can tell you in the mid-90s, if you wanted to find a therapeutic antibody, you wouldn't get anything because there had been a lot of failures. So uh, pegylation of uh, proteins is something Rob and I know very well. And Nectar, again, it was considered an old technology. So um, anyhow, you should be ready to answer the question, but uh, if you can come up with something that's been tried a few times, but you think you've got the way of overcoming it, you can use the examples. You know, just call me and I'll give you the examples to overcome it. Can you all comment on you know healthcare venture opportunities outside US, like maybe in developing countries and all? Or it might <coughs> happen that okay, the venture is there, but the market is for here. I mean, are there any opportunities which might you know encourage development in uh, outside US? Like, I, I don't really have experience out, outside the US myself. Yeah, I, I see it in the, in the research tool arena. There are a number of, I mean, because obviously you can cut costs. You can do. You know, animal studies cheaper, even clinical trials. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, 
you know, a lot of sort of factory type, uh, you know, things that are going on in, in drug discovery and so forth, which ultimately can and people are starting to move offshore for the same reasons that things were moved offshore in the IT arena. Um, I had a company come in this morning, and, and we've had a few of them. We don't we don't aggressively look at it. You know, a lot of the stuff that, that we eventually invest in, you know, is, is a little bit over the transom. Uh, and this was a company in Israel. And I don't want to tell you what they're doing because I'd never do that. But they had raised, you know, two and a half million dollars, and they had spent a million and a half of it. I could not believe how far they had advanced a very very sophisticated mm. product with a million and a half dollars. You know, and they're only raising six to develop a prototype to get ready for humans. It was just mind-boggling. So, you know, Israel is really interesting. It's, it's a lot of signal processing and a lot of stuff that's derivative of, of military technology, but they've got some really, really clever people over there. Given Imaging is a, is, is a company that came from there. Uh, we see a few things from Europe, but... but so were uh, you thinking of India or China? Yeah, India yeah. specifically. No, I mean, I mean as, as sources of the technology, or, or like comments on you know what might be the possible opportunities. So let's say like biomedical imaging is a is a big deal now, right? Which is which is mostly I mean though the applications are biotech or, or biology, it's mostly engineering. I mean, signal processing, image processing, computer vision, artificial intelligence. So in that kind of scenario, I mean, do you think that you know if things are done out there, tapping on the talent which is available there, things might be more beneficial compared to here? Yeah, I'm. I, I wish I, I wondered that myself because obviously the, the whole IT side of the venture business is very interested in India and China now. And there are a lot of deals being done. But on the medical side, not, I mean, it's just, it, it's just not very common to, to go there. And part of it's intellectual property protection. But I, I mean, India, as I understand it, has a very strong generic drug industry. So they have ex some expertise. And then in China, there are a lot of these compounds that could be used perhaps as drug leads. But to my knowledge, very, there aren't many firms pursuing that. Do you think, Fred? I would say that, that we have companies that are starting to market into China more than India. Yeah, but in terms of development. And I think eventually they're going to develop into tremendously big markets for us. It's interesting. Japan has never had much of an impact in the medical device industry. You know, even though they're great at technology, they're great at manufacturing. The rate of change is so high, and somehow U.S. companies can adapt to it. In Japan, they're low cost and, and, and a lot of other things, but rapid adaptation has not been a strong suit for them. So I don't know about India and China in, in the medical device area. I have a, a venture friend who visits me about every six months, and I hook her up with portfolio companies that want to market there. Uh, I, I do have one company that came in, and, and they've been back a couple of times. They have a very specific China-oriented machine uh, because it, it, uh, it's kind of liver assist device. Mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, hepatitis B in China. And it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's so epidemic, it's, it's mind-boggling. And, and this is, uh, is a bridge to transplant, and maybe over a long period of time would be, would be uh, more than that, but, but, it's, but it's real early in the process. Is the best in that? No. No, the non no. idea would be, obviously, the healthcare delivery system of India has to develop. You know, people are getting more income and all the rest of it. So, thinking about how what's happening in the U.S. how that's happening with hospitals and you know, especially you know, how that would evolve. You know, somebody's going to uh, dominate that business. There, there, there is one part of it with India in particular, and that is uh, reading X-rays. You know, that's all done. You know, a lot of that's done there. Uh, medical transcription. A lot of that is, is is done in India. And there is a, there is an opportunity. It has it has uh, costs and, and, and uh, systemic issues associated with it. But outsourcing healthcare, I mean, you know, because the cost of labor is so high, and, and there are physicians over there. There are hospitals in India that, that look like American hospitals. They're doing pretty high volumes. I, I don't envision a day when they'll take a 747 full of uh, bypass patients over there. But, <laughs> but but why couldn't you do something like that in Mexico? You know, somewhere closer. Yeah, so. I think I had last year one of the projects in this class was plastic surgery in India. Great idea. And setting up yeah. a business to do that. Yeah. So. Let's see, we have time for a few more questions. Maybe we'll this is back. primarily for Fred. Getting back to healthcare IT, I know a number of VCs in the Valley were burned five or six years ago and are afraid of healthcare IT because of lengthy sales cycles and implementation cycles. Now, with the proliferation of consumer-driven healthcare and web 2.0 applications, do you see interesting HCIT applications coming on the web-based services side? 
And if so, what, what is going to attract VCs back to that industry? I actually invested in one of those companies back uh, in, in 1990, and it's doing, it's doing quite well uh, in, in a perverse way, that, you know, because it merged with another company that had a different, it was called Health Talk at the time we did it. It was online provision of information on, on various drugs, primarily biologics, for patients. And our sponsors were the pharmaceutical companies, Biogen, Amgen, Genentech, people like that. Uh, we, we merged with a company that had a, uh, a peer to peer marketing selling activity. So it, it's, it's going to do well, but, it, but it's kind of in spite of itself. So, uh, you know, the, the problem right now in the short term is there's just not infrastructure, they're not venture capitalists. They're not investment banks. Having said that, a guy that I know who's a consultant in healthcare IT, and I've used him for things over the years, came in to me about six months ago with a business plan for raising a $25 million fund to do healthcare IT. And I said, Joe, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think this is the time. Everyone has abandoned it. There are still opportunities there. There are challenges with it. But to your point, I think internet implementations, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't discourage it. I think there are opportunities. I like the stuff that other people don't look at. Because if you look at this cardiac stuff that Tom and I look at a lot of, and even orthopedics, I mean, there are still there are still big diseases there. But man, there are so many people and so many companies in each segment. You know, that, uh, that it's a little bit tougher. Yeah, one more question. Uh, when you use a log or an uh, an instrument or method, is that how long uh, did you take for it? to get that food and actually enter the market. Is there a question? <laughs> Sore subject. <laughs> you mean like a medical device? Yeah, how long, uh, yeah, how long that food process took? Again, it depends. As Fred mentioned earlier, are you familiar with the 510K process or a PMA? There are three gradations, 510K, and it, all it requires is bench data to show that it's substantially equivalent to a device that's already been approved, it's supposed to be pre-1976. And then there's a 510K with clinicals where you might have to do 20 human clinicals, but it's also a shorter, we're, we're talking about, you know, a year or so, whereas a PMA requires a large uh, human clinical trial and it takes multiple years to conduct it. Then you file the PMA. It usually takes a year for the FDA to decide whether or not to approve it. So it's at least a three, four-year process on the PMA side. Those are the more capital-intensive companies. Was that the question? Yeah. And in some in some areas, you know, the FDA requires two-year follow-up. If you do an orthopedic implant, yeah, it's, it's two years of follow-up on anything that's, that's an orthopedic. That's another interesting point. The FDA kind of varies on how stringent they are on devices by therapeutic area. If you touch coronary arteries with anything, it's a PMA. I have a company, we just we sold it this year to Tarumo for, for a real good uh, return. We did uh, coils for cerebral aneurysms. I can tell you more about why we succeeded. It's a real neat company. Putting aneurysms in the coils in the brain are 510K. Now, we, we, we had to have, we had to have 30 patients, which we did in Brazil. <laughs> But, but then, you know, there are other things that, that are just, that are... Uh... Could I say one more thing about these uh, medical device trials now that they're adding more of the drug, uh, I'd say, design to the trials where you have to do placebo controls, and that really raises the hurdle of getting it approved because there is the more investment a patient makes in getting a therapy, whether it be placebo or the real treatment, they think that they've gotten the treatment. And so if there's any kind of subjective endpoint involved, you're getting a placebo effect that, you know, various studies in Parkinson's patients have shown that it takes up to 12 months for that placebo effect to wear off. So it, in other words, the control group is getting, in the case of this asthmatics, they're putting a catheter into their lungs and the little box make beep, 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 and it blinks, but it's, there's no energy applied. So the patient thinks they're getting that therapy. And then they respond on a subjective questionnaire as to whether their symptoms are better. That makes it a lot harder. And that's what the drug sort of perspective or the drug uh, rigor has now moved over to the medical device field. And that makes the PMA studies more difficult. 
Roy, a question for, for, for myself? Sure. Tom, if you need to. No, it's okay. Tom, are you sure you're okay? You want to go to basketball? He has, a, he has an appointment at the, uh, the, uh, the arena in Florida at Naples. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, you know, people can now send in uh, cheek samples and, and, and get uh, genealogy and disease susceptibility. And, and I know you did uh, insight and have a lot of the IT. What, what's your perspective on where all that personal genomics is? Yeah, I'm on the board of a company called Sionet that has a 19 uh, SNP or single nucleotide polymorphism test that they're selling actually through pharmacies now in the mid Midwest. So um, it's sort of just bypassing the FDA, so to speak, and going directly to consumers. I think this is a really interesting area. I don't know if you know that the market for nutritional supplements is one third the size of the pharmaceutical industry. So people are deciding to pay out their own pocket. So we think this is uh, certainly for people like Tom who keep themselves in fantastic shape. We've identified 8% of the population absolutely nuts about their health and will spend big money uh, you know, themselves independent of reimbursement and so forth. So I think health and wellness. Um, it's a big deal, and I think the extent to the, the te personalization technologies which we've talked about, people always talk first about uh, you know, uh, personalized medicine, but all this is equally applicable to you know, personalized nutrition, uh, for example, or personalized exercise, with which this company is it's working disease with. Prevention. Yeah, yeah, disease it's prevention. Disease prevention. So that, that's, a, that, that's an area I'm very, very interested in, and I, I think of a, a great, you know, a great, because um, the disease association studies now have been done, with little impacts on the pharmaceutical industry for about 10 years. And there's all this stuff out there. I'm sure if you go to the technology, you'll find relationships between mutations in this gene and you know metabolism of this food or whatever, or effects on exercise or whatever. And the, the IP's out there, and um, you know I think the time is coming now to, to exploit uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of that stuff. It's really pretty. So for example, there's a, there's a gene that metab if you 18% of Caucasians have it, and if you have this particular mutation, you metabolize folic acid at 30% of the normal rate. Well, I don't know if you're, particularly if you're a childbearing woman, that, that is a, so if, that's something you just gotta know. Right? And I've, all my, you know, my general practitioner, he doesn't even, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. He doesn't even know the gene or whatever. So I think there's just a, you know, the, 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 this whole thing is just this, you know, uh, health and wellness people, you know, you know, sort of what WebMD and all these people sort of have in their mind. Uh, that again, it's, it's all these things where people that had the basic concept, but it kind of all wasn't there. But I think this is an area now that uh, I think is really, really ready for prime time. Yeah. Is, is there a market for monitoring? That's one thing nobody touched on, which is like, suppose I can build a cheap device that you wear on your wrist that tells you a lot about your blood pressure every day or tells you about certain compounds in your blood. Can, there's no one, no one right now would pay for that in terms of a reimbursable expense. But is there a market to develop a device? Because there's all sorts of storage, cheap storage and flash. I mean, you can imagine a million yeah. things you could build that would monitor things, but what would you do with the data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there value to it? Yeah, well, it all depends on the particular situation. So, you know, we start off all with all this doom and gloom stuff about, you know, about mm -hmm. healthcare costs getting up to 20%, but there is this segment of the population. People will spend money on their health, right? And if you can have a business plan that, you know, articulates the safe percent and the number of people who want it, you know, because they're, the runners or, or whatever it is about them that will motivate them to pay out their own money. That can be a totally different business model than the sort of doom and gloom sort of cap on, you know, they would obviously have to be specific to what, with what it was people were monitoring and why they would be motivated. But there is a paradigm that it started back in the early 70s, told for monitoring, EKG, real-time EKG monitoring for, you know, 24 hours. People who had cardiac arrhythmias, it's, you know, put electrodes on and strap something on their belt, you know, the recorder, and that's, I don't know what the state of that is. T typically, you're right, there's there's not much reimbursement available for uh, monitoring, unless it's something real specific where, where there's a big payoff if you can uh, intervene. So, certain certain types of pregnancy they monitor, but in general, yeah. nobody has a device that they own. That would be more, I mean, a consumer product. <laughs> At least what I know is that some of the big device firms are looking into that space and trying to enter into some form of partnership. Intel is also looking into that. I know Medtronic is looking into that. Tidal was looking into that. Yeah. One of the big challenges that they realize they are facing is digital reimbursement. So that's going to be part of the a more complete solution. And you hear this buzzword integration of technologies, information technology, devices, and drugs. So you hear these stories and some of the big device firms are looking into that space.
Cancer recurrence is another area, CA125 for colon cancer. There are a couple of markers for things like that that are blood markers that are reimbursed, you know, because you want to catch it if it recurs, so. You know, just one thing thought that came to mind. If you're looking for a project, one really problematic trend in healthcare that we all know about is obesity. I mean, you just look around at our nation, and that leads to diabetes, heart disease, increased risk of cancer, and so forth. So, you know, if I were looking for a project, that is a huge problem. You know, it's hard to find solutions for it, but. And I'll give you one of those big diseases where there are a couple of companies started, but no one has cracked it yet. And I don't have one, but if you have a good idea, I think COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you know, there's so much of it out there that's mind boggling. And it's a really big problem, you know, kind of like atrial fibrillation. It's, you know, it's hard to treat with drugs. And uh, no one has an answer to it. There, there are different things. Use lung volume reduction surgery, but someone's yeah, going to find out a way to emphysema and bronchitis. Uh, that, that's one area where just big numbers of patients and really nothing that works very well. Well, I think walking out of this, nobody should have an excuse for not having an idea for 356. <laughs> <laughs> I think the panel's done a great job of hopefully stimulating a lot of thinking of areas to look at and criteria. And, and if uh, you have any further questions, I think you know, probably a few of them can stay around for a few minutes. And I know also is the, the other purpose of here is for people who have ideas is to hook up with people who are looking for teams. So, uh, so if anyone has ideas, you know, ideas, what I would suggest is maybe gather over here and then other people can kind of find you and talk about the various ideas for 356. But uh, thanks everyone for coming, and I think thanks for our panel.